All right, good evening, everyone. And thank you all so much for joining us. And I'm Dr. Jawan Johnson. Thank you so much for being a part of the Lemon Legacies Porch Talk, So Pious and Institution, Slavery, Religion, Education, and Virginia's Bray Schools. But before we get started, I'd like to do the land acknowledgement. William and Mary acknowledges the indigenous peoples who are the original inhabitants of the lands our campus is on today. The Cherenhaka Nottaway, Chickahominy, Eastern Chickahominy, Mattapanai, Monacan, Nansman, Nottaway, Pamunkey, Potomac, Upper Mattapanai, and Rappahannock tribes, and pay our respect to their tribal members past and present. I'd like to acknowledge the enslaved Africans who contributed to the building and maintaining of this campus um, from its opening until emancipation. And again, before I, I would like to also have the awesome privilege this evening to introduce our wonderful speaker, Mrs. Nicole Brown, who is a scholar and interpreter of women in Virginia, spanning from 1750 to 1800. Ms. Brown graduated from William and Mary in 2013. And over the past seven years, the religion, education, slavery, and colonial Williamsburg have been the focus of her research. As of 2021, Ms. Brown is completing an MA, an MA in American Studies at William & Mary. She is also the Bray School Lab Assistant. Her work as a public historian has taken her across the globe. In 2017, Nicole was awarded a short-term fellowship at the International Center for Jefferson Studies in Charlottesville, Virginia. There she researched 18th century women's education. Mrs. Brown also spoke at Ron's France at the 2018 National Association for Interpretation's annual conference regarding the efficacy of using character interpretation to discuss challenging topics. In 2019, she was awarded a Gonzalez grant by the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation to visit the University of Oxford, studying the Associates of Dr. Bray and the Church of England's involvement in, in enslaved education across colonial America. Without further ado, let's welcome our special guest, Ms. Nicole Brown. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Dr. Johnson. And thank you uh, to everyone who's here this evening. So I'm very excited to talk with you about my research. What um, my research has predominantly focused on as a graduate student is learning more about the Williamsburg Bray School and specifically the enslaved and free black students who attended that school and their teacher. So my intention tonight is to speak for about 40 minutes, leaving 20 minutes for questions, um, which Dr. Johnson will help me with. I want to leave ample time to make sure that you can ask questions. So please feel free also while I am speaking. If you have an immediate question, you can always type it into the chat box so that you don't forget and we can go back and look at that. Without further ado, though, I am very, very excited to talk to you about the Williamsburg Gray School. So to get started, I had such a wonderful introduction, um, but myself, a little bit about me. Normally when you see me in person or on a screen, I don't actually look like I'm wearing uh, 21st century clothing. I actually look like this. I portray specifically Ann Wager, who was the teacher of the Williamsburg Bray School for the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation, in addition to being a lab assistant and having done lots and lots of different um, public facing interpretation for many different museums across several different countries. When it comes though to the research today, I wanna to give you a brief overview of what you can expect. So when we're talking about the Williamsburg Bray School, we have to put it within the context and situation of its world. So first, I'm going to address a little bit religion and education, specifically the Church of England, which was the established church in Virginia in the 18th century, and education's relationship. We'll then look at the Bray Associates in Virginia and beyond, and ultimately then talk about the Williamsburg Bray School, as well as ongoing research currently within Williamsburg and the broader communities of Williamsburg, and I'll open up to questions. 
So when we're talking about religion in Virginia, we live in a world today where through our constitution, there's a separation between church and state, but it is very, very much the opposite in colonial Virginia. And indeed, even before Virginia became um, a, a charter colony for uh, Great Britain broadly in the 1620s, when it was a royal charter colony uh, for the Virginia Company, their charter actually included selections on propagating Christian religion. And Christian religion specifically through this charter meant the religion of the Church of England. So one of the ways that the British Empire tried to establish itself and spread itself throughout the globe was not only through conquest and through um, mercantile sort of uh, approaches, but through religious outreach and approaches as well. And so the idea was that the empire could and would be strengthened by expecting that there be an established religion across its realms, whether in British North America uh, or beyond. In Virginia, particularly though, by the time we get to 1700, the Church of England, also known as the Anglican Church, is very firmly established through religious laws and laws broadly in Virginia. At this point, they've already mandated services on Sundays are mandatory at least one Sunday out of every month. Um, ministers are expected to conform to the beliefs of the Church of England. There are certain denominations that have already been banned from practicing openly in Virginia, such as Quakers. And ultimately, the role of the minister, also known as the rector for each parish, because uh, Virginia broadly is broken down not only by its county, but by its parishes and how they're affiliated, Church of England parishes. And those rectors, those lead ministers in those parishes, are guaranteed uh, a salary, and they are also guaranteed by the early 1700s use of enslaved individuals in particular. This is significant because when you look at parishes across colonial Virginia, by 1776, there are almost 100 parishes across 50 some odd counties at this point. And the retention rate, uh, what I mean by that is the parishes that keep a minister who is leading that community is very, very high. All this information comes from John K. Nelson's A Blessed Company, which is a very good book on looking at the Anglican Church in colonial Virginia. But this is important, not in so much only that it relates to law, because religion is a branch of the law, and the powers of rectors and parishes certainly extends beyond the borders of the churchyard walls, but also to county courts. But it's also significant because as a branch of the government in many ways, uh, the Church of England wields an immense amount of power on education, the forms it will take and the meaning behind it. So the best way I felt I could unpack this relationship is actually looking at the Oxford English Dictionary's definition of education. And this was the primary definition used until about 1840, which is the process of bringing up, the manner in which a person is brought up. The idea is training someone to their social station or the employment that is expected of them. So this concept behind education, I know growing up, I saw education as a way to empower myself to move forward and think broadly in the world around me. But the Church of England is not seeing it that way. And broadly education in colonial Virginia is seen as a way to train someone to the place they are born into, especially because the Church of England rigorously solidifies the idea of hierarchy within multiple sermons and major leaders in colonial Virginia's churches like James Blair, who founded William and Mary. So the idea that the Church of England not only is influencing educational opportunities in Virginia, but how it's influencing educational opportunities is really, really important to understand before we can even address the Bray Associates, since the Bray Associates were not only an institution funded by the Church of England, but one of the largest educative institutions funded by the Church of England in the 18th century. So let's talk a little bit about the Bray Associates. What you're seeing on the screen actually is the online collection through British Online Archives 
of much of the Bray Associates correspondence all the way up to 1900. It does go beyond that, but that has not been scanned and digitized by British online archives. If you go over to the John D. Rockefeller Jr. Library, which works in partnerships with SWEMS libraries, you can get access to it visiting the library. And William and Mary has also been working on acquiring access within SWEM and some of its other libraries to this collection. But the Bray Associates, as I mentioned, are a larger collection that's affiliated with the University of Oxford, where Thomas Bray, who we'll talk about, he founded the Bray Associates, that's where he attended university, and also broadly larger within the Church of England's documents. And the collection is vast. Thomas Bray, it's not surprising his collection would be vast, given that he was an extraordinarily prolific writer, prolific speaker, prolific publisher, and what one historian has described as the most militant Anglican he has ever seen, um, specifically referring to Michael Inesco's work on Thomas Bray. He was a staunchly Church of England, and not only because he attended the University of Oxford, which of course had as, as part of its relationship um, to British education broadly, a relationship with the Church of England. But he actually was also the first appointed commissary. A commissary is a representative to the Bishop of London. North America doesn't have a Church of England bishop um, in its colonies, and so the Bishop of London oversees all the colonies. But he has representatives in each colony. And Reverend Dr. Thomas Bray was actually not only the first commissary to Maryland, but in his time there and when he returned to England, he converted through British law Maryland from officially being a Christian and a Catholic colony to a Christian Protestant colony. He sent upwards of 34,000 books to North America by 1703, and he established most of the major Church of England institutions that are still in existence today. The Associates of Dr. Bray was his last charitable organization, meant as they defined it for not only the education and conversion, but what they also call the inculcation, also known as indoctrination, of those of free African descent, enslaved African descent, African Americans, and actually Native Americans very, very early on, specifically looking at um, North Carolina, Georgia, and New York, although how the Bray Associates would define success with working with different native tribes, it would be defined very differently than what happens ultimately with those of African descent in the British colonies. They ultimately get started through a charitable funding from a very prominent secretary. Uh, Thomas Bray becomes good friends and acquaintances with Sir de Aleon, who is the private secretary to King William and later Queen Mary of Orange, for whom William and Mary is named for, of course. He leaves them a legacy of over 900 pounds in the early 18th century, which to put into context, the school mistress and wager in the 1760s is paid 25 pounds sterling a year. So that's a massive amount of money. The issue, though, is that they don't have a royal charter. So Thomas Bray turns to another friend of his known as James Oglethorpe, who you may know as forming the Trustees of Georgia. The Trustees of Georgia have a charter, but they don't have a great deal of funding. The Bray Associates have a quite a bit of funding, but they have no charter. And so combined, they work together to get their forces established and then eventually separate. The reason I bring them up is because both of these organizations were funded to some degree through charitable religious institutions, the Bray Associates, a little bit more than trustees of Georgia. But ultimately, both institutions are interacting with those who are native or of non-European descent in the colonies that they go to in British North America. And in particular, I bring up here the Georgia trustees with this portrait by William Verilist from 1734. When you're looking at the Bray Associates and you're looking at the Georgia trustees or any Anglican charitable organization, there's an idea of what the organization believes it's doing versus the colonial exchange. And in this case, this portrait by William Verilist conceals as much as it reveals. 
uh, in Verilist's mind, and perhaps the Georgia trustees, this is a passive transaction where the trustees are benevolently awarding education to those who are of native descent in Georgia. But the reality is much more complicated. And those uh, of native ancestry who they're interacting with in this portrait had a much more fraught relationship with that institution than it might appear through the archives of the Georgia trustees. The same can be said of the associates of Dr. Bray. The associates started this organization and eventually formal charity schools in the 1750s would be brought up for those of African descent. But what the archive of the Bray Associates says versus the actual interaction with those who are enslaved or free blacks in Williamsburg and beyond is much more complex than a mere cursory look at this archive would reflect. In particular, we also need to address the fact that the Bray Associates are firmly pro-slavery. They are in full support of the institution of slavery, as is the Church of England and the majority, if not all, of the parishes in Virginia. With the exception of one parish in 1744, my research has shown that every single uh, parish owned enslaved individuals within the 18th century, and actually every minister did, um, Church of England minister in Virginia. The one minister who didn't in 1744, his name is Anthony Gavin, was um, quite controversial within his parish. And so much did his parishioners not want him to continue as their rector in part because of his beliefs on slavery that eventually he actually purchased enslaved individuals, um, a man in particular whose name we do not know. Um, to adhere and conform to the parish's desire. So that's another example of colonial exchange. Another example of this also is a letter to an American planter from his friend in London. It's the only pamphlet or tract that has ever been published officially by the associates of Dr. Bray, or the only one that was officially published in the 18th century. It was written in particular by the secretary of the Bray Associates. And so this gives you an idea of their ideology and how this is ultimately, within our conversation today, going to come into conflict with the students, the teacher, and the community of Williamsburg at large. And if you don't mind, I'll just read out the bolded parts. I propose that you should have your slaves instructed in the Christian religion as the best means to reconcile them to their state of servitude, rendering it more easy and supportable to them. It is the natural effect of such instruction to turn the eye service of slaves into the conscientious diligence of servants. 80 copies of this pamphlet were sent to Williamsburg, which is the largest number of copies of this pamphlet sent anywhere in the world. So I want you to keep that in mind as we're talking about the ideology of this institution and how it's gonna come into conflict with Virginia. Broadly speaking though, the Bray Associates try to reach out to multiple different locations. We can talk more in the Q&A if you want about the establishment of the Bray Associates in Philadelphia, New York City, and Newport, Rhode Island, which were the three other main locations for schools that had any measuring um, length of success. And when I say success, I mean within the parameters of how the Bray Associates define success. So the schools lasted for a long period of time, anywhere between usually seven to 14 years. In Virginia, though, the two schools that ultimately were established was the Williamsburg Bray School and the Fredericksburg Bray School. The Williamsburg Bray School ran between 1760 and 1774 for 14 years. And the Fredericksburg Bray School, they established really 1763, it gets going. Going, and then by 1771, it has shut down. They also try to establish other Bray schools in Norfolk, Yorktown, and Orange County, which are rejected outright, either by the rectors of the parishes they reach out to. The Norfolk Bray School in particular has a very specific itemized letter in which Reverend Ronald, the minister of Norfolk Parish, details exactly why a Bray school cannot and will not occur there. The Nelson family is actually reached out to in Yorktown and they never respond, which is telling. And then in Orange County, the minister in particular gives a litany of objections, that is his direct quote, um, expressed to him by his parishioners as to why a school could not occur there. Similar things also happen in Orange County, King George County, Caroline County, Matthews County, and Northampton County. The main difference being, though, that in those regions, the ministers say, we can't establish a school, but you have sent us a library, and we will share that with the community. 
Whether all of those books were shared with those of African descent, indeed in Norfolk and Portsmouth, we know definitively they were not shared exclusively with those of African descent. Whether all of the libraries were shared with those of African descent, uh, we're still doing more research on. But what is, I think, the salient point here is that pre-1776, pre-American Revolution, there are multiple locations in Virginia where books that are meant explicitly for the communities of African descent to practice their literacy and literacy instruction, and more importantly, faith instruction, um, and the many, many, many multiple ways that can be manifested are well in place before the American Revolution. So when we're talking about the Williamsburg Bray School, the reason I'm gonna focus on that is not only because it's the major focus of my research, but also the major focus of many other individuals' research who are either here this evening or are participating in some of the new initiatives within the broader Williamsburg community. The building you see in front of you in your photograph is of the Bray Diggs building, but more likely in the 18th century was known as the Shields building or the Shields Dig, Diggs building because the building was owned by Matthew Shields for the first three years of its life from 1760 to 1763. Later, the Diggs family purchases the building and it runs as the Bray School between 1760 and 1765, specifically December of 1765. That's when Ann Wager and her students move to another building that no longer exists. This photograph is from the early 1920s and actually shows the Williamsburg Bray School, albeit it had been used in many different forms as um, uh, lodging for the Diggs family and other families up until this point in time. If you were to go over, though, and look for the building today, this is what you would see. So it looks very, very different than it did in the 1920s. And part of that has to do with the genesis of this building. In the 1920s, the Bray Diggs building was purchased by the Methodist or one of the Methodist churches in Williamsburg. There was a Methodist church that actually used to congregate where the Talbots is located down by the historic campus. They purchased the building in the hopes of converting it into to a dormitory for some of the first female graduates at William and Mary. They did that and then weren't quite happy with the building. So they picked it up and moved it a block down and where the building used to be, now Brown Hall, which is across of course from aromas and retros, uh, they built a new dormitory. That is the Brown Hall you see there today. So in many ways, the building was concealed for many years, but it also protected the building because essentially when the Methodist ladies paid to have the building restored from this to this, they sealed the 18th century portion inside. The 18th century portion essentially runs between the gutter that you see on your left and that little, it looks like a gutter, but it's really almost an addition to your right. If you were to go into the building today, these are some of the images that you would be seeing. So what you're actually seeing all the way on your far left is one of the original rooms of the Bray School, as well as an original door and a fireplace, part of which may be original. You also see in the middle photograph, some of those shingles that you saw in that 1924 photograph that were sealed in when they did the, the 1920s renovations. And then the photograph all the way to the right is actually the second floor where they're peeling back layers and layers of plaster to show you some of the original 18th century walls. So there's a lot of exciting research going on with this building, but it also requires that we take a look back at what's in the primary sources and what it says about the people who habitated that building, specifically Ann Wager, the teacher of the Bray School for its entire 14-year duration, and also the students. So broadly speaking, approximately 400, anywhere between 300 and 450 students attended the Williamsburg Bray School. I'm still doing more research on exact numbers. What we know though definitively is that we have currently three years of student lists. I'm ever hopeful we may find another one, but we currently have three years of student lists from 1762, 65, and 69. And they tell us a great deal, not only about the demographics in the classroom and the breakup of the classroom, but more importantly, the children who were in the classroom. 
So the breakdown broadly is that you, about 10% of each one of these classrooms was free black children, in particular, the Jones family and the Ashby family. There is still another free black family with a daughter by the name of Marianne, who we don't have a last name for in these lists. So we're still conducting, I'm still conducting more research on trying to figure out um, who Marianne's parents and her family and community were. Uh, within the enslaved community, it's about 90% of the children who are enslaved. It's an even divide between boys and girls, actually, which is not surprising when you look at the fact that this Bray School, as many other Bray Schools, were all established in cities. And in urban environments, it is very common to have a higher number of enslaved domestics who are girls and women than boys and men. The average age is about seven years old. And from the research I've been continuing to do on the students, this maintains um, uh, itself within the information that I have. But what I really wanna talk about with you is looking at these students as students, as children, as people. These lists tell us a great deal. They're a wonderful place to start, but these students aren't just statistics on paper. They were living, breathing children, who still have descendants in this community, who had thoughts and feelings and challenged their classroom and their world as much as any human being does. And so I wanna talk a little bit more about some of my other research that speaks to that level of humanity. Part of that has to do with the curriculum at the Virginia Bray schools. Henry Dixon's English instructor was the most common or one of the most common books that was sent to the school, as well as some of other sermons from in particular, Reverend Bacon, who, Reverend Bacon was a minister actually in Maryland who wrote four sermons to slave owners and two sermons to Negroes. That's what he calls them. And that's actually one of the other most frequently sent texts to the Williamsburg Bray School. There are other books like The Indian Instructed, Instructed which if you've ever read Adela Equiano's um, Ex-Slave Narrative, he actually mentions The Indian Instructed in that particular narrative. And there are several other books. You have to wonder looking at these books, but the children holding them in their hands, what sections are they reading? What sections are they taking away from that classroom and sharing with their siblings who might not attend the school or their parents or their community? Where are they challenging what's in the book? Where are they not? We may not have answers to this, but it's important that we ask them nonetheless, if we're going to look at these students beyond just their names on a list. Overall, the Bray School books breakdown also shows you a little bit as well. Although Bibles, Testaments, Psalters, and prayer books, Psalters are uh, the hymnal books ultimately that the Church of England uses, and religious pamphlets are sent too. Spelling books and primers are the number one book that is sent to the Williamsburg Bray School. And this information actually comes from all of the lists of the catalogs of books that the Bray Associates shipped across the world between 1753 and 1817. So I've done some more statistical analysis on this, but it tells you, you know, she's teaching and wager is teaching these young children. They're anywhere from three to 10. They're getting their hands on these spelling books, on these primers. They're interacting with them in their classroom within the confines of this building that is 33 feet by 17 feet. It's not that big, four rooms with a breezeway in the middle, a hallway. So this exchange between the students holding the books in their hands, what the Bray Associates want to be taught, what Ann Wager wants to be taught, what the students want to be taught, it's all coming into conflict. It's all coming into exchange in this very small, very confined space. And I say confined from my own biases and experience, because if hopefully if you ever are in this building in August, it is quite confining. <laughs> when we're talking about the Bray School though, and talking about the students as well, we also need to look at institutions of power and the relationship of these institutions of power to the Bray School and to the students in the community at large. A majority of rectors from the time that the Bray School is established to the time it shuts down, as well as presidents at William & Mary, because often the rector, the primary minister at Bruton Parish is the president of William & Mary, uh, participate in this Bray School, either as trustees 
or in sending their own enslaved individuals, in particular Reverend Dawson and Reverend Horrocks, as well as Reverend Dawson and William Dawson, their wives. Vestrymen, uh, the 12 men who are appointed by the rector and the community, uh, broadly speaking, to help run the parish are also involved in the school. And again, as this parish is linked to William and Mary, it's important to acknowledge that these vestrymen are affiliated with these two institutions of power. And then there were students who were enslaved outright by William and Mary who attended the Bray School. So I'd like to take a minute, if we can, to reframe our narrative. A lot of times we discuss the students who attended the Bray School in relation to who enslaved them. But I'd like to just mention a few names. All of the 88 names we have are important. All were members of the Williamsburg community all interacted with institutions of power. But I'd like to name the names of the few who we know had direct affiliation with William and Mary as an institution of power that enslaved them or individuals affiliated that enslaved them or Bruton Parish. Elizabeth and Grace, Charlotte, John, Jane, Doll, Dolly, Elizabeth, Catherine, Fanny, Nancy, Isaac B, Joanna B, Clara B, Hannah and Sarah, Aggie, Sam and Roger, Mary and Harry, Molly, Adam and Fanny. I think it's important to say the names of these students because if we're wanting to understand more broadly the history of this school, we cannot just frame it on what the Bray Associates keep in their documents or on the trustees who corresponded with the Bray Associates. You have to look at the students themselves. And so where I wanna end sharing some of my research with you is what I have been working on, which is reframing this narrative to focus more extensively on the children who are very much the legacy of this school still in the community today. One of the ways I've done that is by working with, she's a wonderful historical theorist named Marissa J. Fuentes, who has this incredible theory called reading along the bias grain. She discusses this specifically in her book, Dispossessed Lives, which looks at enslaved women and the violence that an archive, a Western archive can place on those women. Bias grain is the idea of taking a piece of fabric. If you've ever done this, you can do it right now and you stretch it on the diagonal and it allows you to see the weft and the warp of the fabric. And when you pull along the bias, you'll see things in the grain of the fabric that you might miss elsewise. And that's actually what you can, and in my case, I have been doing with some of the documents as it relates to students. So I can't share every story with us here tonight because we have an hour, but I'd like to share a few. In particular, Hannah. Hannah is one of my favorite students to talk about. Hannah was seven years old when she started attending the Bray School in 1762, and it appears she graduated. Graduation and how that is gauged is very, very interesting because the Bray Associates deem graduation to be, you can read and write the Ten Commandments, the Apostles' Creed, and the Lord's Prayer, although certainly these students extended beyond that. But she graduated in 1765 at the age of 10 years old. And Robert Carter Nicholas, who is one of the most prolific authors, um, that is also a trustee, but one of the most prolific correspondents with the Bray Associates, writes about Hannah, although he doesn't name her by name in this letter. And in fact, it took me two years of looking at this letter through my own biases to realize by doing the math that he was talking about Hannah. What he essentially says is, and this is a longer letter, but he's writing to the Bray Associates in effect saying, this school is not functioning in way, the ways you thought it would, going back to that colonial exchange I talked about earlier on. And he says in particular, I have a Negro girl in my family who was taught at the school upwards of three years and made as good a progress as most, but she turns out a sad jade which is a very derogatory way to look at Hannah. But if we take this letter and we look through the bias grain as Marissa J. Fuentes encourages us to do, what we see is that Hannah is clearly not only using her instruction in a way that is antithetical to what either Robert Carter Nicholas expected and or wanted, but that it has irritated him enough that he has put it in a letter to the Bray Associates. What that tells me is actually as much about Hannah as Robert Carter Nicholas. Here's a child, here's a young girl, a young girl who's gonna grow up 
living in Williamsburg, likely being enslaved, possibly as a lady's maid, to one of Robert Carter Nicholas's daughters, who is taking this instruction at seven, eight, nine, ten, and and looking at it in a way that is completely different than Robert Carter Nicholas. While it's fragmentary, it's important nonetheless to look at. Two of the other students who I in particular have been doing some research on and trying to talk about and say their names are Edmund and Johnny. Edmund and Johnny were likely about six or seven years old when they attended the Williamsburg Bray School. They were enslaved by a man named Colonel Chisel, who if you're familiar with him at all, you're likely familiar with him for two reasons. One, because he owned the property that Patrick Henry would later purchase and rename Red Hill. And two, because Colonel Chisel was involved in a very infamous murder case where, because it never went to trial, because he passed away just before the trial, he allegedly killed um, a Scottish, white Scottish merchant named Robert Rutledge in cold blood. One of the ways this case has been talked about within public memory, especially in Williamsburg at museums and institutions alike, is that it actually affords us one of the earliest crime scene diagrams ever printed in a newspaper. That's actually what you're seeing in front of you. But what is often overlooked is the lad or it's he sometimes is called a boy in these records, whether that's meant to be derogatory or reflects his age, I don't know. But this lad or boy who Colonel Chisel demands get his sword so he can attack Robert Rutledge and the young man's refusal. And that's in particular what I'm highlighting here in which the Virginia Gazette, it was quoted in Purdy and Dixon in June, that on threatening to kill his servant if he did not comply, the lad went for the sword and delivered it to his master in the shed room. What does that say? Edmund and Johnny, we know are being taught the 10 commandments at the Bray School. They're being taught thou shall not kill. And yet one of them may be coming into conflict with that very notion with their slave owner. Certainly, if it wasn't Edmund or Johnny who was there in the case of this murder, they knew who was. Were they related to them? Possibly. Again, it's important to look at these documents, reframing them from the perspective of Edmund and Johnny in this case shows you this world of conflict and contradiction that Edmund and Johnny are living in. And then Jack and Sal, who I also love to talk about. Jack and Sal were seven and eight years old, um, approximately. I'm still trying to figure out their definitive ages. But they were young boys who visited and attended the Bray School in different years and were both enslaved by Jane Vogue of the King's Arms Tavern. You may be familiar with Jane Vogue because of her relationship, or quite frankly, she enslaved, Gowan Pamphlet, who was the first officially ordained Black minister in the United States, although I want to be very clear that Gowan Pamphlet and his predecessor, Moses, were very, very important to this first Baptist church and Baptist communities broadly within Williamsburg. Jack and Sal, we know, were attending the school, reading, studying, learning, and then going back and living at the King's Arms Tavern. How did they come into contact with Gowan? Did they ask him anything about they were, what they were learning in the classroom? How and what, in what ways does Gowan's relationship to the Bray School speak to uh, literacy broadly, literacy within faith, and literacy in relation to First Baptist Church and churches broadly in Williamsburg? It's something that's worth continuing to study, but you can't look at Jack and Sal on their list and not look at where they lived or who they lived with because if you don't, you don't see the broader connection broadly, not only to Williamsburg, but potentially First Baptist Church. And then Isaac B is another student who I very much like to talk about. I should be clear, we know he did at least have two other sisters, Joanna, who was named after his maternal grandmother, and Clara B. Possibly Dolly also was related to them. Their mother was likely Fanny, who was an enslaved cook in the Blair household. And their father was John Insco B, who was not only a free man of color, possibly a shoemaker. He's related to the shoemakers that are part of the Rawlinson and the Flower families in Williamsburg. Um, but we also know that his father, Isaac B's father, studied under Fleming Bates, who was a Quaker um, educator. And for those of you who are familiar with the Quakers, you know that their education, let's put it mildly, is completely antithetical to the Church of England. <laughs> so Isaac B. actually runs in 1774 when he is either 18 or 19 years old. He also runs again in a later runaway ad 
that another colleague of mine, Nick Nichols, found in 1793. And it, he runs, as, they, as the enslaver mentions Lewis Burl in this particular runaway ad, because, quote, he thinks he has a right to his freedom because his father was a freeman and I suppose will endeavor to pass for one. How did Isaac's study at the Bray School interact with his belief in freedom? In what ways didn't it interact? These are questions worth asking because when we do, we look at Isaac not just as a name, but as a person, which is how he should always have been looked at, but through the archive has not always been looked at. So these are just a few of the areas of my ongoing research, but ongoing research with the Bray School and the Williamsburg Bray School is much, much broader. Um, where there's many different researchers looking at post-American Bray School revolution, or pardon me, research on Bray School's post-American revolution, of which there were many in Nova Scotia and the Caribbean particularly, but the Bray Associates had a reach as far as Japan, Singapore, India, multiple different countries on the continent of Africa, Mongolia, Russia, the list goes on. So studying that as we move into the 19th and 20th century is also important. In addition to that, uncovering Black leadership and Black educators within the Bray School diaspora, many, many, many of the teachers in Nova Scotia pre-1830 and the Caribbean pre-1830 were Black loyalists who uh, emigrated after the American Revolution to these communities and then started teaching at Bray schools. And then highlighting Black, vo black voices despite the archival bias, that's a big focus of my research, as well as engaging with and trying to focus on descendant community in Williamsburg and beyond. I've had the great privilege to speak to a few and engage with a few members of the descendant community, but certainly more work needs to be done, which leads me to talking about some of the new initiatives. So the Bray School Lab is William and Mary's newest initiative. In fact, the photo you see in front of you is Travis House, where I work as the lab assistant, as does uh, Anne-Marie Stock. Maureen Eldersman Lee and Margaret Morrison. We're all gonna be part of a virtual Q&A next Tuesday. I highly encourage you to attend, but always feel free to stop by, ask us questions. We would love to talk to you, especially if you have more questions about the Bray School or the descendant community broadly. So the Bray School Lab is William & Mary's branch of the Bray School Initiative. In addition to that, the Bray School Initiative also works with the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation. So it's a joint venture between both institutions to learn more about the Bray School, the students who attended it, the teacher who taught there, and how those connections still permeate in Williamsburg and beyond today. So if you want to get more involved moving forward, I know we'll have time for questions, but I want to make sure that you are aware of on the CW side. If you're interested in learning more about the building, I highly encourage you to join the Architectural Preservation and Research at CW Facebook page. The screenshot you see in front of you is actually something uh, that Danny Jaworski, who's a wonderful preservationist on that team, some of the items that she recently found actually in the Williamsburg Bray School walls. So if you wanna learn more about what's happening with ongoing research and collaboration on the building itself, physically, I encourage you to look further through architectural preservation and research. And then of course, as I mentioned on the Bray School lab side, we have a meet and greet next Tuesday from 6.30 to eight. And of course, although there, the link is available through the Lemon Project, I would be happy to also drop that invitation link in the chat box this evening for anyone who would like it. Last but not least, the way we are understanding and thinking about the students is constantly changing and evolving. The way we're thinking about the school is constantly changing and evolving. So I'm absolutely excited for your questions this evening because those questions spur further research, further questions, and different ways to consider the many, many meanings behind the school. So without further ado, I would love to transition into the Q&A. Are there any questions for me, Dr. Johnson? No, I first just want to thank you so much. Let's give you a virtual applause for, for this wonderful presentation. And um, we have some time. We have about 15 minutes, 20 minutes or so, just for questions and answers. And um, if you would like to place those in the chat, or we can... We can definitely have those answered. Okay, we have first question here. Let's see. 
When did Virginia make educating the enslaved illegal? This is a fantastic question because it's actually, uh, first of all, it's much later than even I myself had been taught in a classroom, one, but two, by the parameters of what the law says versus what's actually happening, that depends. So after Gabriel's Rebellion, great Gabriel's Rebellion, for those of you who do or don't know, was a rebellion in the early 1800s. And realistically, there were other rebellions all the way till 1802 in Richmond, led by a man named Gabriel. Um, some people call him Gabriel Prosser, although he never self-identified that way. His enslaver was a man named Prosser. Um, the uprising in Richmond was unsuccessful. And after that, you start to see in Virginia's legislative code, a tightening of restrictions on legislation regarding literacy for those of African descent, as well as those of native descent. The first time you see that really is in 1808, where they say essentially, because prior to this, those who were enslaved and apprenticed to trades through their enslavers were expected to have a pretty high degree and level of literacy carpenters, milliners, they're very skilled trades that require detailed account keeping and in some cases knowing French as well as English. So in 1808, there's a law that goes onto the books that effectively says you can have somebody of African descent be apprenticed to a trade, but they can't learn any reading or writing, which effectively makes it almost impossible for them to be apprenticed to a trade. This is linked to Gabriel's rebellion in some ways because Gabriel was actually a blacksmith, if my memory serves me correctly, but he was a highly skilled craftsman. Moving forward, ultimately the restrictions tighten completely by 1831. June of 1831, actually just two months prior to Nat Turner's rebellion, in which Nat Turner, a man who is not only extremely literate, but very, very much a man of faith, um, leads an uprising in Southampton, Virginia. That being said, Although it is defined in the books by law that not only can no one of African descent or native descent learn to read or write and no one who is a free black or white can teach them, this technically doesn't restrict this from occurring because unfortunately, if we're looking at this through the eyes of um, legislation that centers around enslavers, what an enslaver does with how they would define their personal property can be only restricted so far by the law. So we do see other people. In fact, a great example is Frederick Douglass, who's being taught to read and write well beyond the restrictions of these laws, because as quote unquote personal property, that's what his enslaver wants. So when we talk about when is reading and writing banned, it's a good question, technically 1831, but what is that exchange between law versus what's actually happening in the world is a broader way to think about this. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. We have a, another question here. Uh, was there a theme to the objections that the parishes that refused to host Bray School raised? Or was there kind of a common theme for those who chose um, not to accept these proposals? Yes, there is a common theme and it's a great question. The common theme seems to be that there is a strong objection from the white parishioners to having black, uh, enslaved or free Blacks have access to resources that perhaps their white children don't. Mm -hmm. um, you see this in Orange County in particular, but one of the other major um, restrictions or objections is in relation to the fact that, especially in Norfolk, there's a concern amongst the enslavers that Reverend Ronald mentions that even if you were to get this school to run, mm -hmm. you would not be able to find a teacher willing to do it, one. And two, if you did, we wouldn't want the school to be filled only with free blacks. Mm -hmm. uh, Norfolk, uh, Norfolk in particular has the largest free black population in Virginia, although Williamsburg also does have considerably a, a sizable population. So it seems to be a combination of all of those things. When it does find success is usually in a city, Williamsburg, Philadelphia, Newport, Rhode Island, and New York City all already had schools for white children. Mm -hmm. So I think that's important to keep in mind when we're yeah. discussing this. Yeah. Great question. That is, because I think about this competition theory that comes into place. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is, we have several good questions here. Mm -hmm. um, 
Why did the school close in 1774? Why did the school close in 1774? It's a duel. One of the reasons is because the teacher passes away and actually up starting in 1768 until 1774, Robert Carter Nicholas, the trustee I mentioned, complains about Ann Wager, complains or laments, depending on your interpretation of the document, uh, about Ann Wager being ill and that sometimes the school can't run because she's unwell, but he cannot find anyone to replace her. So the school effectively shuts down on August 20th of 1774 because Ann Wager passes away and he cannot find another teacher to replace her. However, 1774 is also a very politically fraught year. Mm -hmm. And you can't look at this political tension without seeing how religion factors into it. You have this power of the established church. So even in communities where they say, oh, you know, we have some issues with this Bray school. Williamsburg is part of that. The Church of England is so powerful and wields so much power that even if people object to it, it's the Church of England paying for it. So as the Church of England begins to lose its established power through the years leading up to the American Revolution, you also see the Bray schools one by one start to shut down. And actually by 1777, every single Bray school in North America has shut down because the associates are concerned that all of these schools are in a war zone effectively. Mm -hmm. Now, later on, the Philadelphia Bray School does reopen in 1786 and actually runs to, from what I've been researching, as late as 1945. But it wow. was abolitionist decidedly mm -hmm. when it reopened. And in fact, there's a wonderful quote in the minute meetings of the Bray Associates post Nat Turner's rebellion that says, we've just heard about this rebellion. We're so hopeful that this will encourage those who are enslaved in Virginia and North Carolina to flee to Philadelphia where we can teach them in our school. So very different than what's happening pre-American Revolution. That is, it's yeah. very interesting. Yeah, and it was hidden within, it was like page 305 of the minute yeah. meeting. <laughs> so you have to really dig, yeah. You have to dig, I can attest mm -hmm. to that. Mm -hmm. um, it says, can you speak about the uh, to the Bray schools in Africa? Were there any in Egypt? Mm -hmm. This is a great question. And the answer is, I don't know. And I think it's important to say when I don't know something. Not that I don't know because the information isn't out there, but I just haven't gotten that far in my research. So mm -hmm. I would encourage you to ask that question moving forward again when more researchers have been focusing on that. Mm -hmm. Definitively, what I can say is that there was a very large enclave of free Blacks from Nova Scotia, specifically Preston and Halifax, that were led actually not only by Limerick Isaac or Isaac Limerick, depending on who who you talk to, but Catherine Abernathy, who was a black female teacher in Nova Scotia, they took almost a thousand free black, um, black loyalists from Nova Scotia to Sierra Leone. So Sierra Leone, I know, had some affiliation. Cameroon also had some affiliations with the Bray School, but as to Egypt, I still have to do some more research within the archives. Mm -hmm. So I don't know right now, but that doesn't mean we don't know broadly. And this person wanted to ask, um, let's see here, was there any difference between, or have you found in the, in the records that there was any difference between the treatment of free versus enslaved students at the Bray School? Oh, a great question. So the answer is also, I'm still researching that. Not mm -hmm. that I don't know, but it's so complicated when you look at the fact that many of the students who were enslaved were likely related to the students who were free. Mm -hmm. Williamsburg is a very small community. The yes. Ashby's are related, you know, even within Isaac B's family, he's yeah. related to the Rawlinson's and that side of the family's all free, but yeah. his side of the family is all enslaved because of the status of their mothers. Yeah. So interestingly, when you look at the Bray Associates documents, their pamphlets and tracts, they do not distinguish any difference between whether you are free or enslaved. You are identified above, and actually they don't even distinguish between genders. Mm -hmm. They identify above all by your race which speaks to this very racialized form of education, but also speaks to how deeply the institution of slavery and uh, racism permeates by this point in Virginia, right? Um, it doesn't matter if you're a boy or a girl, free or enslaved, if you are of African descent, then this is how we're going to teach you. Now, that being said, what does that look like amongst the black community? I'd imagine very different. Mm -hmm. So more research needs to be done 
on that particular point. But what I can tell you is from what I've already seen is it's very complicated because many of the free students we know were related to other members of the enslaved communities in Williamsburg. Did any of the free students um, or the parents rather, were they paying tuition? Did anyone pay tuition? Right, so great question. No, nobody paid tuition. Um, not because the Bray Associates didn't try. Mm. <laughs> so actually the Bray Associates as early as 1760 when the school opened through William Hunter, who was one of the first trustees and uh, Reverend Dawson tried to establish a subscription. In fact, we still have the names of that preliminary subscription who agreed to pay, but never did. So they, the Bray Associates, what they really want when they establish all of these schools everywhere, not just Virginia, is that ultimately the community broadly, specifically the white community will see the benefit of these schools and they will fund it themselves. Mm -hmm. Whether it's New York, Nova Scotia, Philadelphia, or Virginia, mm -hmm. that does not happen ever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, on the one hand, it allows members of the free black community to come in because they don't have to pay for this instruction. On the other hand, it also speaks to this nature of, because the schools are funded by the Church of England, that's really what allows them to continue running. Mm -hmm. And if you wanna read genuinely one of the nastiest financial legal disputes I've ever seen on paper, reading the correspondence between the Bray Associates and Robert Carter Nicholas circa 1769, it's, it's pretty nasty. Um, and in fact, the Bray School Lab is working on some transcriptions, one of which includes uh, the letter draft letter that the secretary wrote to Robert Carter Nicholas, but did not send. It's a um, lot juicier than what actually got sent. Now I had a, a question, another question related to that. And that was the lawsuit between Ann Wager and John Insko B. Yes. Mm -hmm. Can you speak a bit about that? Yes, I can. I'm still John doing so. Be being the father of Isaac B. <laughs> right, right. So, so obviously, Dr. Johnson and I talk quite a bit about our research. <laughs> um, to give you context, as I mentioned, Isaac, Joanna, and Clara B.'s father, John Insco, is the only person that I know of that Ann Wager ever took to court. Now, some of those documents are missing, but we know that she took him um, to court in particular for some sort of financial transaction, um, whether or not it was related to the school, I think it's very unlikely that it was, but rather to his business, uh, I'm still trying to do more research on, but it does speak to hierarchy and levels of power and that this white woman, she's a woman, but she's a free white English woman, the kind of authority she can exert over even a free black man right in this legal system. So still doing some more research on what that potentially, that, that money that was owed to her, what it was for. Mm -hmm. There's been some idea that maybe it was for the school, but I think that's very unlikely. Mm -hmm. Also, um, my boss, Anne-Marie has encouraged me, and I think it's a great idea to mention all the wonderful, wonderful transcribers and partners and thought partners, student thought partners, community thought partners who have been part of our project so far. So for any of you here, thank you for being here. And um, we're just so excited to continue having you not only at the lab, but working and moving forward. Um, members of the descendant community, William and Mary's undergraduate and graduate community, and actually volunteers from the community broadly have all begun to participate in the lab. And if you're interested, we certainly encourage you um, to reach out to us at braylab at wm.edu. All right. I don't think we have any more questions. Okay. <laughs> wow, uh, you have phenomenal questions. Yeah, no. Wait a minute, there is, a, there is one. Um, okay. Okay, there's a question, we have a couple of minutes. Have you identified um, the descendants or any descendants? Yes, we have identified some descendants. I am not going to mention their names here mm -hmm. because they have not given me permission to do so. That's and I true. think it's very important when we're discussing mm -hmm. that. That being said, we, we have not identified all the descendants. Mm -hmm. If you think you might be a descendant, please reach out to me, please reach out to the lab. Again, I dropped the Bray Lab email in the chat box. Um, you, you can reach out to any one of us. You can come to the Q&A next week, but mostly we want you to feel, if you believe you are a descendant, that you have as much stake 
in this project as we do, and that we're here to serve you for what you need. So especially within my own research, I'll just speak for me now as a graduate student, whatever I can do to support you, if you think you might be descended from a Bray School student, I am here for that, um, to make sure you have the resources you need and the lab is here to make sure that you have the resources that you need. Um, but yes, we have identified several descendants, uh, which has been very, very exciting. I've had the honor to speak to several different individuals who uh, are amazing. They're just so wonderful. And I had a question that closed us out and it kind of homes in on, um, you mentioned about humanizing yeah. um, the students yeah. and how do we humanize without romanticizing or placing an agency on them that they often did not have? Dr. Johnson, what a great question. And you're, you're, it, it so perfectly relates to um, another historical theorist who I really encourage you to read if you haven't called Sadia Hartman. Mm -hmm. Sadia Hartman wrote a beautiful article, very brief, but very profound called Venus in Two Acts, which discusses this exact topic. In particular, she was looking at a young enslaved woman named Venus who was murdered on a slave ship. And this idea of how do I discuss Venus without romanticizing Venus? How do I discuss her within the st stringent and harsh reality that she lived in? And what Sadia Hartman offers to us, I think can be paired with another historian called Michel Rolf Trio. And indeed, this is what much of my master's thesis work is on. Michel Rolf Trio talks about silences occurring in archives at stages. And if you have a big enough archive, you can pit a silence that occurred in the creation of a document with retrospective significance on what's been said about that document. There's a difference between history and what has been said about history. But you can't always undo every silence. And this is where Sadia Hartman's work is important. She said, essentially, rather than placing another imposition on the girl to teach a Venus in this case, to teach a lesson, which is not fair, you have to let the silence sit. Mm -hmm. And the silence may sometimes become a scream, but you have to sit in it. It is whether I can answer a question or not about a student doesn't mean it shouldn't be asked because it speaks to their humanity. And if we can't answer it, then we need to sit for a moment and reflect on why that is. Yeah. And I think in some ways that is the best that I, you can do currently with some of the students while also always being aspirational. History is always being rediscovered. So I am ever aspirational to find more documents that speak to not just the humanity, but the lived experience of these scholars because they had a life outside of the Bray School and the white people who were affiliated with them. What did that look like? Speaking to their overall collective humanity. But I'd encourage you to read Sadia Hartman's Venus in Two Acts or Michelle Roof's trio's Silencing the Past to look a little bit more at that. A virtual applause. <laughs> Thank you so much, Nicole, for joining us. Did you have something you wanted to say? I just saw that, um, and I apologize if I pronounced your name wrong. Yvonne Johnson had asked about the names of the free Black students. Oh, yeah, yes, yes. Matt Ashby, Harry Ashby, and Mary Ashby. Alicia and Mary Jones, and a young girl named Mary Ann. I still don't definitively know her last name, but I'm looking. Thank you so much again. Thank you all so much for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your evening. It has been great. And um, follow our social media platforms to learn about our upcoming programs for um, this month. Have a great evening. <laughs>